Let me talk to you. For 20 years, LA Knight has been honing his craft and developing his skills to become one of the hottest stars in wrestling today. And throughout that time, he's been involved in so many different parts of the entertainment business. From acting as a guest star on multiple television shows, to taking part in the motion capture of the WWE 2K game series, to winning world titles in the middle of the ring, LA Knight has gone through seemingly everything one can do before making it to the WWE. And all that hard work seems to finally be paying off as every time he walks down the ramp, microphone in hand, the crowd explodes in excitement. But before he was LA Knight, he was known simply as Eli Drake. My name is Eli Drake. Simply just another wrestler looking to finally catch a break. So how exactly did Eli Drake end up becoming LA Knight after two decades of hard work? Well, on my last LA Knight video where I covered his entire WWE run, I asked you guys for 800 likes in order to make a video covering his time before the WWE, and well, you guys got over 5,500 likes and made it the most popular video on this channel. So, my name is Grisha from Wrestleology, and today we look to find that answer as we talk about the transformation of Eli Drake into the leader of the Yeah! Movement. Yeah! Growing up in Maryland, LA Knight, real name Sean Riker, became a huge fan of pro wrestling at the age of three. This love for the business grew alongside him as he graduated North Hagerstown High School before quickly transforming that love into a potential future career. He moved to Cincinnati at the age of 20 to begin training for in-ring competition, and on March 17th, 2003, Riker would start his lifelong pursuit of becoming a pro wrestler. Now, he did have a super rare appearance on the actual WWE card back Back in 2006, where he teamed up with none other than John Moxley, who would later go on to have a successful career in the WWE under the name Dean Ambrose, against the Big Show in a handicap match, in which was essentially just a squash match that Big Show went on to win. But for years after, Riker would continue working in the indies to build up his reputation. He won gold across multiple promotions, from the HWA Television Championship to even becoming the NWA Heritage Tag Team Champion alongside Brian Cage. This team alongside Cage became a big part of the early career of Riker as they formed the natural selection. No, Charlotte Flair wasn't wrestling just yet, so the name was available for them to steal. The two would hone their craft alongside each other, primarily in the Wrestling from Hollywood promotion. However, this duo wouldn't last forever as Riker lost the tag team titles on behalf of the team and this spun off into his first big program in his young career. Cage and Riker would feud for several months following the tag title loss, which culminated in a casket match in late 2012. The match itself was actually pretty fun for a 2012 indie match with both men already showcasing that they have what it takes to put on a good match even with a difficult stipulation like a casket match. There, Sean Riker was able to outmaneuver Cage and get the win, but impressive performances like that casket match as well as his natural charisma, which was already starting to take shape in the early stages of his career, led to WWE picking up the phone and calling the future LA Knight. And in May of 2013, Riker was signed to the WWE Performance Center following years of sporadic appearances as enhanced talent. All right, guys, are we ready? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. There, he was given the name Slate Randall before making his debut in a dark match against Yoshitatsu. You guys remember Yoshitatsu? Yeah, so he would get the victory over Tatsu before once again becoming enhancement talent for the real future stars of NXT like Mason Ryan, Baron Corbin, and Mojo Rawley. He was then released from his WWE contract on August 1st, 2014, and while it looked like the release was due to supposed budget cuts, Riker claims that it had more to do with his own personal issues with some of the coaches at the time. And considering Bill DeMott would be revealed a year later as someone who abused his position of power as the head coach in WWE's Performance Center, it's not too difficult to figure out who Riker might have been talking about in those claims. Bill just turns, I'm standing right there, and Bill goes, yeah, well, he doesn't take direction very well. And I'm just looking at Bill like, what did I do to you? But either way, Riker was out of the WWE. Yeah, the future LA Knight was fingertips away from accomplishing his dream of competing for the biggest wrestling company in the world, and yet Riker was released due to some backstage politicking by people above him. Certainly nothing new to the wrestling business, but it still has to sting in hindsight. 
But with that release came time for reinvention as he took to the independent circuit with the new name Eli Drake. Over the next few months, he would make sporadic appearances throughout different promotions before finally landing in Impact Wrestling in 2015. After making his first appearance in the Gut Check Tournament, a tournament that showcased Impact's new potential signings fighting for a contract, Eli was offered his own contract after impressing people backstage despite losing the tournament finals. And only a month after his debut, Drake would align himself with Drew Galloway, aka Drew McIntyre, and Micah, aka New Japan's Tang Loa, to form The Rising. This group seemingly had one goal, destroy the Beatdown Clan. The Beatdown Clan, or BDC, was the most powerful faction in Impact Wrestling at the time. The heel force consisting of Kenny King, Loki, and MVP had risen to power since its inception, and The Rising were there to put an end to that power. However, it would only end in disaster for The Rising as they lost a four on three handicap match which per stipulation forced the rising to dissolve notably eli drake was already cutting promos around this time that were eerily similar to his promos later on as la knight he was already oozing charisma, metaphorically screaming for an opportunity to put those incredible promo skills to the test as a top star in the promotion. And he found that opportunity during Drew Galloway's match for the Impact World title on the July 15th episode of Impact. He cost his former friend the match, turning heel and leading then-champion EC3 to retain. Drake would end up defeating Galloway at No Surrender the following month, and Drake's heel turn would only see his stock grow in the company. As a heel, Drake had more freedom on the mic and if you ever heard this man speak then you know the more freedom for eli drake the better and this natural charisma carried drake as he continued to rise up the card in impact wrestling throughout 2015 he continued to mix up with some of the main event talent in impact at the time including galloway ec3 and even kurt angle the company definitely had high hopes for him which is why they handed him a golden ticket for success when drake won the feaster fired match on january 16th of the following year if you haven't heard of the match before let me give you some context. Let me talk to you. During the match, there are four briefcases hanging above the ring, with each briefcase having its own unique prize. A shot at the Impact World title, a shot at the tag team titles with a partner of your choice, a shot at the King of the Mountain title, or a pink slip that would leave this unfortunate winner of the briefcase without a job. It's essentially a Money in the Bank match where you're either getting a shot at the title or you're losing your job. Another brilliant idea by Vince Russo. Either way, Eli earned himself a shot at the King King of the Mountain Championship, which he eventually won by cashing in on Bram a few months later. Between him winning the briefcase and the title, however, he was involved in a growing rivalry with Grotto. You see, Grotto received the pink slip during that match, which he would not take lying down, especially since during that feud, it was revealed that Drake had actually taken a peek at which briefcase had the pink slip before the match had even started. So he deliberately knew which briefcase not to get, but despite his cheating ways, Drake won the King of the Mountain title before using this reign as a way to continue his climb up the card. Around this time, Eli Drake had also begun a talk show segment called Fact of Life, named after his popular catchphrase. This segment became a breeding ground for some of Eli Drake's most popular moments in the company. He even had his own button on the show that said, Dummy, yeah. Dummy. Dummy. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime he pressed it, and this obviously became the seed of his yeah catchphrase many years later in the WWE. Yeah. Through this talk show, Eli Drake would also progress his feuds such as the case when he and James Storm shared the ring as Eli held the King of the Mountain title. This then spun off into a feud between Drake and one of TNA's most successful homegrown talents, and while he may have lost that feud to Storm, losing the King of the Mountain championship in the process, Drake was still being positioned as the next top star in Impact. He continued to feud with some of the more popular names in Impact like Storm, EC3, and the now broken Hardy Boys, and many more. Eli Drake would continue toiling in the upper midcard for the next year as he fought the biggest names in the company, and through this time in that upper midcard scene, he would end up hiring Tyrus, better known as Brodus Clay, as his bodyguard. He would also end up befriending Chris Adonis, better known as Chris Masters, as the two quickly established themselves as a charismatic and highly professional team. The two even fought against D'Angelo Williams and Moose at Slammiversary in 2017. However, just a month later, Drake would finally end up at the top of the mountain as he won the Impact Global Championship, the name for the world title at the time, after winning a 20-man gauntlet match. This was Drake's first major world title in his career, and he used it to help grow his character along 
alongside Adonis. However, after defeating Matt Sedell, Johnny Impact, Alberto El Patron, and more, Drake would end up losing the title in February 2018 to a returning Austin Aries. He would end up losing in the rematch a few weeks later, now left adrift as his partnerships with Adonis and Tyrus had long since collapsed. So, Drake looked to get back on top following another victory in the Feast or Fired match on March 15th. There, he took down the briefcase containing an opportunity at the Impact Tag Team titles. However, now that he didn't have any partners left in Impact, Drake really didn't know what to do with his briefcase, so he challenged Moose for Moose's briefcase, which contained a shot at the World Championship. And thanks to the interference of Ohio versus everything, Drake was able to get the job done against Moose. In the weeks after, though, Drake would end up finding himself a partner to cash in his shot at the Tag Team Championships. And the then-champions, LAX, had no idea what was about to hit them as Drake revealed his partner to be none other than the big bad booty daddy Scott Steiner. Drake and Steiner were able to take the Impact Tag Titles from LAX at the Redemption event before Drake ended up cashing in his shot at the world title a few weeks later. But he was unsuccessful in his quest as he lost to Pentagon Jr. who retained the title. And things just kept continuing to fall apart for Drake as his tag team title reign alongside Steiner would only last a little under a month before they lost it to the team of Andrew Everett and DJ Z. Eli would then transfer this loss into another high profile feud between himself and the legendary Scott Steiner, who lost his former tag team partner following a chair shot by Drake at Under Pressure. Eli continued to circle the upper midcard scene of Impact Wrestling, and after losing his shot at the World Championship at House of Hardcore, Drake would continue to just live life as normal before coming face to face with the monster Abyss at Bound for Glory after Drake had started issuing open challenges week in and week out. This would kick off a feud between the two, with Eli calling Impact an unsafe working environment after being chokeslammed through the table by Abyss. Drake would continue criticizing both Impact and the concept of hardcore wrestling as a whole. But after a few months of feuding with the Impact Hall of Famer, a feud that also saw cameos from ECW legends Tommy Dreamer and Raven, Drake finally met Abyss in a monster's ball match. Essentially, a hardcore match that has become synonymous with Abyss. However, it would shockingly be Eli Drake who would pick up the victory after tying his opponent's hands together and hitting him over and over again with a steel chair and a wooden paddle. But this this would end up being his last big moment in Impact Wrestling. A few months following the Monsters Ball match, Drake would be scheduled to compete against Tessa Blanchard at United We Stand. However, Drake legitimately refused to partake in the match due to his own discomfort with intergender wrestling. Whether he was right or wrong for that is up for debate, but what is not up for debate is Impact's response to this predicament. Due to those complaints, along with several other complaints Eli had about his booking at the time, Drake would end up being fired via email by Impact. However, Drake's popularity was unquestionable at this point, so he quickly found a new home in NWA following his debut as the mystery partner of Nick Aldis during the Best in the World pay-per-view. However, during the year he was there, Eli only continued to impress people with his incredible promo style. Sure, he may have won the NWA tag team titles alongside former rival James Storm, but the main talking point surrounding Drake during his fairly brief time in NWA would be his promos. There, on a brand new stage, Drake would use the opportunity to showcase more of his talents. If you haven't already, please go look up his Shoes of a Champion promo. Sure, that promo never led to any world title success in NWA, but that kind of charisma and energy is what he brought to the show every week. Is he a little goofy? Yeah, sure, but it was unique to Drake, and it's that energy that helped him stand out. And it's also that exact energy that had WWE's attention, especially after Drake was quietly released from NWA in late 2020. And from there, as they say, the rest is history, with LA Knight soon debuting in NXT to begin his meteoric rise in popularity with the rest of the WWE Universe. When looking back at the career of LA Knight before making his way back to NXT a few years ago, it's fascinating to see just how good he's kind of always been. Just looking back at his work, even as early as 2013, you can see that spark of charisma that he brings with him today. He's strangely always been a really good sports entertainer, so it's baffling that he's only now starting to see a stock rise. Seemingly since day one, he was walking to the ring with a kind of energy that made it impossible for you to take your eyes off him. No wonder WWE called him the first time around in 2013. And even though he's only now getting the recognition that he deserves, LA Knight has always been as talented as he has shown through his brief time on the main roster. And now that he's in WWE, it's going to be interesting to see just what LA Knight will do in the future. The success that was once only a twinkle in the eyes of Eli Drake can now be found as he is the megastar of WWE. Don't be a dummy. Yeah!
I said, don't be a dummy. Yeah. yeah. I said, don't be a dummy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you already know to pay attention to WWE's hottest star going today. That is just a fact of life. Yeah. Subscribe if you enjoyed.